everybody. Welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Dana Tripiana, and I cover infamous gangsters every week in a true crime-like format. My show, Mob Times, comes out every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Sometimes. Well, it's Tuesday. It's 5 p.m. So here I am. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, I hope you already know how much I love you guys. I love interacting with you. And thank you so much for all the love and support that I've always received from you guys. Before we get into today's episode, I haven't done a daily life update in a while. So let's discuss real quick. Today has been a super emotional day for some reason. I'm not really sure, but I'm totally in I'm being a bitch mode. And I don't mean like I'm being mean to everybody. I mean like everything is bothering me. I'm getting super emotional. I'm like feeling like crying. and I'm, I'm not a crier. Like that kind of day. And I think it's because of two things. One, today is the eight year anniversary of my best friend's death. I talked to my friend this morning and he said that he was going to do the memorial. So it's just kind of been on my mind all freaking day. And I just keep feeling like emotional about it, which is strange because it's been eight years. Like I miss him. I miss him every single day, but it's not usually like emotional anymore. I don't really cry over it anymore. It's been a while since I've felt like this. And today it was like that. So it's just been shitty. Second off, I am rewatching One Tree Hill right now for the umpteenth time. I have anxiety, and that means that I love watching shows over and over and over again. But it's been a while since I've watched it, and I forgot how that show touches on so many major issues that I've experienced in my life. Today, Haley's mom died, and it was so friggin' sad, and my mom died, so I just, I relate to it, and that just led to me being a total bitch all friggin' day. So, anyway... <laughs> I'm really excited because I should be recording the Maverick episode soon. For people who don't follow me, Maverick is another content creator and he has a huge following. And he's going to be putting out an episode covering my best friend's murder and it's going to have its own episode, which is so amazing because he already did an episode that he read off the Reddit post and he donated $2,000 to the GoFundMe that I have to hire a PI. So the fact that he's going even further to make an episode just about my best friend, it's just absolutely amazing and I cannot thank him enough. He's doing the episode, but I'm recording pieces for it. And I should be doing that this week. So I just cannot wait for that episode to come out because it's been eight years exactly to this day. And this is the first time that anybody has ever spoken about this case. Even though I've reached out to people far and wide, all the biggest content creators, everyone that does true crime, I've reached out to everyone. And I've done that for eight years, begging to have this case spread so that people could hear it and see what went on. And it's just so screwed up. So to have that finally come true and have Maverick do this episode, it's a dream come true. And I'm so excited. I'm so happy. And I cannot wait. So enough about me. Let's go ahead and get into today's episode, huh? So today is going to be on Nicolo Cola Shiro, or Nicola Shiro, a Sicilian-born gangster who was an early New York City mafia boss. So just a quick heads up. I know that normally I am 100% correct with every single fact that I state. I'm being very sarcastic here because I make mistakes all the time and I get corrected in my comments on a regular basis. And I'm always willing to learn where I went wrong so that the next time I mention that, I know to say it correctly because I bring stuff from my old episodes into my new ones all the time. So if I said something wrong, please tell me. Like, if you know something that I don't, tell me so that I can correct it if I ever say it again in another episode. However, tonight's episode is a little iffy. I know that all the stuff in this episode is double fact-checked 
But I'm not gonna lie, I got so confused so many times in this story. Like, I'm really good with the Mafia post Castella Marisi war. I know so much about that. But when you go before that, I get murky. I don't really know too much about the old, old time Mafia. There were so many times in this episode that I convinced myself that Shiro was actually part of the Morello gang, that he led the family that defected from the main gang, which we will go over, but he wasn't. Shiro's gang was completely separate and had never belonged to the Morello gang, and I just kept getting confused with that. There's a lot of things I kept getting confused with, so take today's episode with a grain of salt. So today's episode starts on a sunny day in September, back in 1872. We are going far back, ladies and gentlemen. Matteo Shiro and Maria Antonia Rizzuto, a young couple living in the quaint Sicilian village of Roccomena in the province of Palermo, were about to welcome a new member into their family. Their bundle of joy was named Niccolo Shiro, a name carefully chosen out to honor his grandfather, who had once served as the mayor of Roccomena in the 1840s. Now, Niccolo, from the get-go, this kid is a firecracker, okay? He shows an unquenchable curiosity, and just, he has a huge hunger for knowledge. Like, you cannot put out this kid's hunger for knowledge. It just cannot be quenched. His parents, Matteo and Maria Antonia, they see this spark in him, and they decide that they're going to fan the flames, and they're going to make sure that this boy goes to school and gets an education. Even though it's really not always that easy to make sure that he goes to school and goes all the way through school, in this rural setting of Rakamena, it's pretty common to see people dropping out in 5th, 6th, 7th grade. So picture this. Young Niccolo is becoming known in this village as the kid who just like cannot put down books or get enough of books and learning. His thirst for knowledge is insatiable. He's going around, he's asking people questions about things. He's always exploring. He's just a very curious kid and just wants to learn. Picture Belle in the opening scene of Beauty and the Beast. Somebody who loves reading, loves books, loves education. And that wasn't always so common in this sleepy village where everybody kind of had their job passed down to them, generation to generation. A farmer's kid from this town is going to be a farmer. The pharmacy owner's kid is going to run the pharmacy when their parent can no longer do it. And here's young Nicolo just yearning for an education. Honestly, I searched high and low, and I could not, for the life of me, find what his parents did for an occupation because, remember, he was born in 1872. Not the greatest recording. But I'm willing to bet that it wasn't anything education-driven. It wasn't, like, a researcher or anything. So people are looking sideways at this kid. His grandfather, also known as Niccolo Shiro, so they go by the same name, was a big deal in the history of Rakamena. He held the prestigious position of mayor during the 1840s, and his legacy left a really deep imprint on the community. Everybody knew who this family was. Somewhere in the late 19th century, figure probably somewhere around like 1880 to 1890, the family decided to pack their bags and wave goodbye to the lovely hometown of Rakamena. This would put Shiro somewhere between the ages of like 8 and 18, so he's still really young. And honestly, this move is going to be where Shiro does most of his growing up. They headed for Camporiel, Sicily, which isn't too far away. Camporiel was his mother's hometown. That's where she was born and raised. So that's what made the family move to Camporiel. Paolo Orlando was a cousin, and he hailed from Camporiel, and he became best friends with Niccolo. These guys were attached at the hip. You did not see one without the other. As the years rolled on, Paolo Orlando's life took a pretty dramatic turn. Rumors started swirling that he had ventured into the notorious criminal underworld, and it turned out to be true. Paolo made quite a name for himself. He climbed the ranks of the Sicilian Mafia until he had became a Mafia boss. And his name even became synonymous with Mafia activity as far as the French colony of Tunis. So this guy's a big deal in the Mafia. And people that hear his name, the second they hear it, they're thinking Mafia. 
In 1897, Niccolo's family made the bold move. They packed their bags and set sail across the Atlantic Ocean, leaving behind the rolling hills of Sicily for the hustle and bustle of America. Now, I did not see that Matteo headed over and set up a life for the family, and then the family followed after. I'm not really sure what that's about. Maybe that happened. I just don't see it anywhere, so I don't want to say that happened. But the family went over to America. He would frequently make trips back to Sicily, and every time he returned, he had to tell Customs what he was doing in America. He would usually tell them that he would be staying with his uncle, Antonino Governale, another boss in the Mafia. Fast forward to 1902, and Nicolo has found his new home in the vibrant neighborhood of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. In 1913, Shiro hit a snag in his path to becoming a U.S. citizen. They turned down his application, saying that he didn't know enough about the U.S. Constitution to be able to become a citizen. Getting U.S. citizenship is a really critical step in cementing your presence in the country. You really can't do anything until you're a citizen, so it's a pretty big deal that he can't get citizenship. But he wasn't one to give up easily. He knew how important it was to become a naturalized American citizen. So he came back in 1914, he crossed his T's, he dotted his I's, and bing bam boom, he is an American citizen. Back in the early 1900s, New York had these really strict rules, and they were called the Blue Laws. These laws had some really curious rules, including no-nos on certain activities on Sunday. Sunday was kind of like a sacred time for religious observance and rest. So one of these laws said that businesses like butchers couldn't operate on Sundays. Kind of the same idea how right now, today, 2023, you can't go out on a Sunday morning before noon and buy liquor. Like, I'm pretty sure I tried to buy a beer at like two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night and they wouldn't let me because it was Sunday morning. Like, bullshit. But these blue laws existed. Nicolo Shiro found himself on the wrong side of these blue laws. He got arrested for running a butcher shop on a Sunday earning him his first arrest in a long career of arrests. In March of 1912, Nicolo Shiro stepped into the coveted role of the head of the local mafia. He was replacing the aging and ailing Sebastian Di Gaetano. Di Gaetano was, like a lot of the Castella Marisi clan, straight off the boat from Castella Mare. He was a barber and a very long-time mafioso. But... Let's be realistic about what this means, because realistically, nobody in the world ever has just gone from being like this bookworm nerd to the leader of a local mafia. It has never happened. So let's rewind to the beginning. Shiro was just this innocent little kid navigating his life through Sicily, pursuing an education, curiosity, knowledge, all of this. Let's rewrite that. Shiro the grandson of a mayor and cousin of a mafia boss, grows up alongside his mafia boss cousin, and his grandfather probably had a place in the mafia too, because remember, back in those days, politics and mafia kind of were the same thing in Sicily. Shiro was not just this kid seeking out an education, and he did get an education. He graduated high school. But he was not just this kid just like, oh, curious about the world around him. No, he was involved in the mafia from a very young age. He definitely had his own reputation with the mafia, and he just didn't get caught back in Sicily or before this in America. He definitely had a history in the mafia. It's just not written down anywhere. For a long time, before Shiro had ever even arrived, Williamsburg had been a hotbed for organized crime. Di Gaetano had ruled with an iron fist, starting somewhere between 1909 and 1911, and he had replaced Paolo Orlando, Shiro's cousin. Remember in the beginning, I told you that one of Shiro's cousin, they were BFFs, they were attached at the hip. Well, that one came to America, became the boss, gave boss to Di Gaetano, and now Shiro is taking over. Di Gaetano would actually end up navigating the family through some pretty good times and pretty bad ones. There was a lot of really nasty turf battles that went on. But as it goes, time catches up with everybody. His health was fading, and there was some discontent simmering within the ranks. 
To your average Joe on the street, Nicolo Shiro looks like your friendly neighborhood barber. He runs a barber shop on the bustling Graham Avenue. He did all he could to avoid any kind of conflict or violence or getting caught for crime, which is why he got along really well with law enforcement. They saw a drastic decrease in violence in the area when he took over, and they knew. They knew he took over. But as soon as he took over, the area stopped seeing so much crime, so much violence, and the authorities liked that. (laughs) Guys, my pup's making an appearance. He's making a cameo. That's Zeus. Hi, Zeus. He knows to stay on his bed. He was so against violence that his kindness was sometimes perceived as weakness. Joseph Bonanno mentions Shiro in his book, citing him as weak. It seems pretty unlikely that he was actually weak, though, given his friendship with some pretty big mafia names. Some of the people that were in his crew and were letting him be the boss of the family were Gaspar Messina, Francesco Lanza, Nick Gentile, Stefano Magadino, and Gaspar Malazzo. So if those guys are in a family and they're allowing you to be the leader and they're not killing you so that they can take over as boss, I think it's fair to say that they respect you and you're not really weak. You're a good leader. But a lot of times in these situations, your kindness is perceived as weakness and because you're not ordering deaths every other day, you know, you're weak. Shiro was a mastermind with a plan. He spent years plotting his ascent to the top, and his rise to power was nothing short of calculated and strategic. He gathered the who's who of the mafia world in a dimly lit back room of his barbershop. He started the meeting with, gentlemen, we all know why we're here. Di Gaetano cannot lead us anymore. Rivals are closing in all over the place, and if we don't make some moves, we stand to lose everything we've worked so hard to build. He stood up and said, I say, I step up as the new head of our family. I've got a vision, a plan to keep our power secure and expand our reach in the city. To his benefit, Di Gaetano is weakened and he's bedridden. He's losing his grip on power. And Nicolo Shiro's charm and cunning have won over quite a few hearts in that room. Everybody really likes him. He's been a member of the family for a long time and they trust him to take leadership. After the secret meeting in the dimly lit back room of the barbershop, it was unanimous. Nicolo Shiro became the new head honcho of the local mafia. Let me tell you, that decision, it sent shockwaves through the criminal landscape of Williamsburg. It's a game changer. The new boss of the family, and he didn't even have to kill the boss of his family to do it. He was just like, listen, I'm doing this, and if you don't like it, come at me, bruh. Do something. And Di Gaetano was not built for that. He did not want that smoke, and Shiro took over as the boss with really no problems. Shiro, he took over as boss and he changed a lot of things. The Williamsburg Mafia turned into a powerhouse. His relationship with the legit people in town, the mayors, the cops, everybody, made it a lot safer for his guys to be on the streets because cops weren't just arresting everybody that they thought was in the mafia. Now, remember the guy that he replaced, Sebastian Di Gaetano? He was a very big shot. Things did get a little weird with Guy Channel because he is going to come up again in this story. But he was arrested in December of 1910 on suspicion of planning to kidnap two kids, Michael Rizzo, seven years old, and Giuseppe Longo, eight years old, for ransom. So that's not like, that's kind of unhinged behavior. And again, we will talk about him again in a few minutes, but it just kind of goes to show you, like, dude is not stable. He's not normal. Probably a good thing that Shiro took over. The charges were dropped due to lack of proof, but let's be real here. Back then, if you were arrested for something, you probably did it. Like, they did not just go around arresting people all willy-nilly. He did that shit. They just couldn't prove it. Now, enter Salvatore Clemente, who was a Secret Service informant and a counterfeiter in the Morello gang. Clemente, born in Corleone, was a made man in the Morello family. He became an informant for the Secret Service after an arrest in 1902 for counterfeiting. 
See, nowadays, it's really no big deal to hear about a guy in the mafia doing dirty shit, wearing a wire, reporting every word back to a handler. At this point, honestly, I feel like it's kind of expected for guys in the mafia to narc. But that is not the case back then. Hearing about an informant from this era is almost completely unheard of, which means the information that he supplied was extremely important to the feds. Because when you have so little informants, you have no idea what's going on. You need informants to be able to have an idea of what's going on in the family. So this is a big deal. This is their first chance to get a glimpse inside this organization that hasn't even established itself as an actual mafia yet. Clemente told his handler that there were four gangs in the mafia. He explained the process of becoming a made man, which the FBI had never even known that there was an initiation in the first place, let alone how the initiation process had been carried out. He fingered countless men who were supposedly upstanding citizens. They had never heard that these guys are criminals or in a criminal organization, but Clemente was there to say, oh yeah, this, 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 and this dude. Yeah, they were in and he would continue to supply information to the FBI as time went on. Unfortunately, a lot of the information that he supplied would never actually be transcribed, and we can't see it now because it had never been written down, or it was written down and those records were never saved. But even the small glimpses that made it into the history books provides us with a huge insight into the mafia at that time. It shows its actual age and how the stage was set for the five families a lot further back than the Castella Marisi War. A few months later, Clemente gets summoned to a meeting with Di Gaetano. Di Gaetano lays down the law. He tells Clemente, you are done with your forgery business until we deal with a mafioso named Carmelo Cadaro who is suspected of being disloyal and they want to kill him. And he pretty much tells Clemente, like, you and your business are done for now until Kadaro is gone. So we'll talk about Clemente a little bit more in a few minutes. But for now, one thing important to know is that the Morellos are one of those four families that Clemente had reported on. And now the FBI is aware that there's four families in this mafia that they're newly learning about. The Morello family is one of those four families, and the Morello family is led by Giuseppe, Joe the Boss, Morello. I wanted so bad to say Masseria, I swear. I'm like patting myself on the back for not saying Masseria. I guess everybody with the name Joe is just Joe the Boss. There's no Sam the Boss or Bill the Boss. It's always Joe. Every single time, Joe. Joe the Boss. Joe the Boss, Masseria. Joe the Boss, Morello. They're all Joe the Boss. Whatever. So the Morello family has a history that is packed to the brim with territorial disputes and violence, completely opposite from Shiro. The Shiro family, they don't really like to have disputes or wars. They don't like to kill people. They like to just live their life, do their crimes, mind the business. That is not how the Morellos get down. The Morellos, they love to fight. They're here for it, okay? They want all the smoke. Now, Joe the Boss Morello, he's the leader, but he was arrested in 1910 with Ignazio Lupo, the boss of another family, and they are currently serving 10 years in prison in Atlanta. Yes, I know, I know, some of you are going to come for me and you're going to say, hey, Ignazio Lupo was the underboss to Giuseppe Morello. You would be wrong. No, Lupo had his own little family. He was a boss. So yes, I'm aware, Ignazio Lupo, he's well known to be an underboss, but he's not. It has come out that he was the boss of his own family, so that is the information we are going to be going on. Ignacio Lupo, boss of his own family, he and Joe the Boss Morello, they do a counterfeiting crime. They're doing 10 years in Atlanta. Now shit's going down. I have an episode on Morello, so if you want to know his entire story, I'll have that link in the description, but I'm just going to give you guys a quick summary. Morello is a member of the Corleonisi family. So now, back then, each family had its own little space. There was a palmetiri from people from Palermo. They had their own little family. They got the Corleonisi. They got the Castella Marisi or Castella Mare group. So this group of Giuseppe, Joe the Boss Morello, this is the Corleonisi people. And this man's name spans back ages. We're way back in the Stone Ages, and his name goes back even further. 
He is mafia royalty, with Bernardo Terranova for a stepfather and Giuseppe Battaglia as an uncle. These guys are big hitters, like big hitters. He arrived in America when he fled Italy after committing a murder and fleeing. He, like Ignazio Lupa, was tried in absentia, meaning that he was already gone, but they had a whole case, they found him guilty, and a conviction was there and waiting for him if and only if Italy could ever get their hands on him again. So they're like, hey, you are guilty. You murdered somebody. He didn't have to be there for the trial. He had no ability to stand up for himself or give his side of the story. Nothing. They found him guilty. If he ever goes to Italy and they catch him, he's done. He's going to jail for murder. Ignazio Lupo, same exact thing. He had committed a murder in Italy. He had fled and been found guilty in absentia. He made stops in Louisiana and Texas, but he fled Texas when he had to run after yet another murder. That and half his family came down with malaria, but you know, that's no big deal. So they're like, yeah, we got to jet up out of this place. We got malaria. We got this boy killing people. We got to go. The family landed back in New York in 1897. Morello spent some time buying and selling businesses. He had a restaurant. He had a warehouse. He had things before he was arrested in 1900 for counterfeiting, and then again in April of 1903 for murder. This man is legit a serial killer. He just roams the world killing people wherever he lands. And we know that that's true for a lot of mafia guys. A lot of these mafia guys kill people a lot. But Morello, he will go to Texas for five days and kill somebody in that five days. Like, this man just cannot get along with anybody, and he will kill you if you don't like him. In the meantime, he's gaining a lot of power in the Corleonesi Mafia family. By 1902, he was the boss of the family. His counterfeiting operation had reported ties with the Buffalo and Chicago families. And that's just what can be proven by people in his family being arrested. So you can assume his family ties probably go further than that. He can't run the family from prison, so that is where D. Gaetano comes in. Di Gaetano is the same guy that Shiro had taken power from. So now when Shiro took power, Di Gaetano is no longer the boss of a family. So then when Morello goes to jail, Di Gaetano steps in and helps the Morello family. This is why I got so mixed up and I kept thinking that Shiro was in a family that was a part of the Morello family because he was leading Di Gaetano's family. He took leadership from Di Gaetano and then Di Gaetano went and led the Morello family. So it's super confusing to me. So I'm just sitting here scratching my head thinking that Shiro is in the Morello family, but he's really not. He is in a completely different family. It was just Di Gaetano was like, I'll be boss. I don't care where I gotta go to be boss. I'll be boss. They won't let me be boss there. I'll go be boss here. Now, Di Gaetano, he was kind of chosen because he was not a threat. Morello could put him in place to lead the family, and he didn't have to worry that this dude was going to revolt and insist on staying the leader of the family. He's like, all right, I went to prison. This is 1910. I'm going to jail, but I don't know if I'm going to get found guilty. I just know I'm getting arrested. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put Di Gaetano in place to hold the position for me, and then we'll see what happens. When they figured out that they were going to be there for a while because they got a 10-year sentence, a new leader was chosen for the family. An election was held and Salvatore Toto Di Aquila was elected as the new boss of the family. It's likely that there was probably a pretty large meeting that was held to decide this since they weren't just choosing the replacement to lead the family. Morello had also been Capu di Tutti Capi, the boss of all bosses, and that position needed to be filled as well. Di Aquila ended up taking both positions, so you gotta assume it's not just people from his family that are choosing this. It has to be people from the entire mafia because he's going to be the boss of all the bosses. So we would assume that hopefully all the bosses get a say in who is going to be their boss. So now Shiro... He's not really too happy with this. He's not a really huge fan of the Di Aquila. So he decides that he's going to join forces with the Morellos in order to give them a fighting chance against the mighty Di Aquila family. Now, let's talk again about Salvatore Clemente, our Secret Service informant and Mafia insider, who's playing a pivotal role in uncovering this web of intrigue. 
His network of sources within the mafia and access to inside information helped him piece together the rising tensions between the Shiro Alliance and the Di Aquila crew. So now there's something going on between the Morellos and Shiro and the Di Aquila crew. So just to set the stage for exactly where we are right now in relation to where we are like now in 2023. So right now in the story, we've got four families. We've got Manfredi Minio. He's leading one family. And that family is going to go on to become the Colombo family. We've got Salvatore Di Aquila leading one family. And his family would go on to become the Gambino family. And then the third leader we've got is Nicolo Shiro, and he is leading what would come to be known as the Bonanno family. On the other end, we've got Giuseppe Morello. So right there, we've gotten three families. Now on the other end, we've got Giuseppe Morello, and he's leading the Corleonesi family. And that family will later split into two families, and that will leave us with the five families that we know and love today. So right now in the story, there's four families. We got the Minio family, the Di Aquila family, the Shiro family, and the Morello family. Now, trouble had been brewing, obviously, since you see alliances being made, and a war kicked off between the notorious Morello gang and they go up against the Capu di Tutti Capi, Salvatore di Aquila. The first report of trouble was made by Salvatore Clemente on November 1st, 1913, when Clemente called his handler to report the death of Louis Verizzi, and he told him, like, listen, this is probably going to turn into a war. By the 4th of that month, he was reporting that another mafioso, Giuseppe Fontana, was killed. He was in the Di Aquila gang, although he had only recently become a Di Aquila member. He belonged to the Morello family, but defected over to the Di Aquila gang, which kind of makes sense why he was killed. You really just don't do that. If you do that, you're pretty guaranteed to die. So, you know, you just, uh, uh. but that's obviously going to set off some anger on the Di Aquila side. He thinks that he just acquired this cool new little mafioso and now he's dead. So she's going to be a little pissed. She's a little mad. On the 8th, so we've gone from the 1st to the 4th to the 8th. This is an eight day span. Clemente calls up his handler and tells him that he knows why Fontana was killed. He said he was killed by Manfredi Minio, and Minio is one of Shiro's boys. He's the boss of a family, but he's friends with Shiro. During this report, he gives a little more insight into the war. He says that the war consists of four gangs, three versus one. The first gang is the Manfredi Minio gang. The second is Shiro's gang. And the third is the Lamonte gang. And I'm guessing the Lamonte gang is like a gang within the gangs, like... It's a crew, not the actual gang. I'm not really sure here. This is what I'm telling you guys. I'm a little confused here. I'm not 100% clear on exactly what's going on. The Lamontes, they have a whole family, but they're not one of the four families. So I'm thinking it's more along the lines of like they're a, an important crew in one of the families. I'm, I'm not really sure. The fourth gang in the squabble was Di Aquila's gang. So now it's Minio, Shiro, and the Lamontes, and they're going up against Di Aquila, which will go to show you that Di Aquila has a pretty important and powerful family. Now, we're soon going to see a ceasefire, but one more death would take place before the ceasefire would happen. A ceasefire was in place between November of 1913 and May of 1914. In May of 1914, which is what obviously ends the ceasefire, Fortunato Lamonte, the leader of the third gang, was killed. Umberto Valente, Joseph Biondo, and Accursio Diminio, on Di Aquila's orders, in retaliation to the Fontana murder, killed Lamonte. And now the war is officially back on. A year and five months go by without a word. And on October 7th, 1915, Ippolito Greco, a Morello member, was killed. He was in the position that Lamonte used to hold, so he's the new boss. Six days later, Lamonte's brother Thomas and sister Rose were killed. Now, those deaths completely wiped out the presence of this gang in Harlem. Like, that gang does not exist anymore because all the Lamontes are dead. And now that whole territory was Di Aquila's for the taking, and he just gets more powerful. Thomas's killer, 19-year-old Antonio Impaluso, was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to death for the murder of Thomas Lamonte in 1917. 
Now, with the whole Lamonte family and Greco dead, Salvatore Loyecano stepped into the position of boss of the family. In the end, despite the fact that it was three on one, the D'Aquila family came out on top. And that just kind of reaffirmed his position of Capu D2 T Capi. And it shows everyone exactly who is boss. Chiosu Gallucci was also killed in 1915. I have a video on Gallucci, and honestly, I kind of forgot that he was even alive at the same time that this is all going on. So this part I'm about to tell you about, like, I didn't even find it in my research with Shiro. I just knew it from the Gallucci video, so I'm gonna go through it, but I didn't really see much mention of this in the Shiro research. So Gallucci did have some beef with the Morello gang. They had decided that Gallucci was a dick and they did not want to be friends with him anymore. They just kind of didn't like him anymore after they had been friends for a really long time. And that prompted them to join the other two gangs in the war and leave Gallucci behind. Gallucci had recently lost both of his bodyguards when they were killed in an attempt on his life. So nobody wanted the position because like he kept losing bodyguards. He lost a whole ton of bodyguards and nobody wanted the position. So he's in there, he's like, you know what? I am so safe, I don't even need bodyguards anymore. But like really, like he cannot find somebody to be his bodyguard because every single person that had taken the position of his bodyguard was dead within like a week or two. So he is out there all alone with no protection. He was killed alongside his 18 year old son on May 17th, 1915 by Generoso Joseph Nazaro. Now, Gallucci's murder set off the Mafia Camorra War that went on from 1915 to 1917, which kind of piggybacked off the 1913 war, and it involved a lot of Mafia gangs in the city. Now, this one is completely separate from the one that we just went through with D'Aquila, but it looks like the Morellos were fighting wars on both sides. This war with the Morello family versus a bunch of other factions, they actually won this one. This war is a war between the Morello family, a Sicilian faction based in Manhattan, against the gangs that included members from Naples and like the surrounding Campania region. In this war, the Camorra got absolutely decimated, and the American-based Sicilian Mafia group, or Morello's dudes, they walked out on top. This war lasted a while, and the tensions following this war probably lasted until the night of the Sicilian Vespers, if I'm being honest and took out everybody that belonged to that era. Like, this was a bloody, deadly war. So now in December of 1920, when things took a violent turn, Salvatore Loyecano, a big shot in the Morello gang, he stirs the pot, and he takes over the family with the blessing of Salvatore D'Aquila. He took control of the family after multiple prior leaders had died. But now the trouble is, not everybody is on board with this power shift, especially the crew that's loyal to Giuseppe Morello. Giuseppe Morello had just been let out of jail. He had been given a prison sentence. Him and Ignazio Lupo had been arrested together in 1910. They did 10 years in Atlanta. Now Morello is out. And Loyekino, he just took the position of boss of the family and they're not happy about it because they said, oh, Morello's out of jail. Morello will be boss of the family. But oh no, no. Loyekino was like, no, I'm boss. Morello had sent a letter to Loyekino telling him, you need to step down as boss of the family. I'm out of jail. I can take over. You need to step down. Loyekino is like, huh, no, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. I have the nod from D'Aquila, who is Capu D2 T Capi. I'm leading the family just fine. I'm going to go ahead and not do that. And you can go ahead and fuck all the way off. Morello's people were not about to take this lying down, and Loyekino was murdered by a Morello loyalist in his first floor restaurant at 247 Elizabeth Street. Now, this murder pissed D'Aquila the hell off. D'Aquila had given Loyekino the nod to lead the family himself, and nobody had gotten permission to take out a sitting boss of the family. This situation is really bad. Like, picture Gotti killing Paul Castellano bad. Nobody got permission. They just went for it and did it. And now the Capu D2T copy is pissed. At Salvatore Loyecano's funeral, held at his home on December 10th, 1920, seven mobsters gathered around his corpse and they swore an oath to avenge his death. Specifically, they all agreed to deal with his enemies as his enemies had dealt with him. Now, fast forward a bit, and all but one of these vow makers, Salvatore Moro, Angelo Patricola and Giuseppe Granatelli, they all end up getting whacked. 
A fourth guy, Angelo Lagatuda, he gets shot up, but he survives. This guy, he sucks. And honestly, he does not deserve to be the one that lived. He abused the shit out of his family. He beat his son to the point that his son didn't grow anymore. Literally stunted his growth with the amount of beatings that he threw this kid. And he's the only one that lives. Now, he needs to use devices to walk. He had gotten shot or something like that. So he needs to use devices to walk, like crutches, canes, walkers, whatever. He always has to have something to help him walk. And he took these devices and hit his family members with them. It's okay, though. Like, if you were upset about that, it's okay. Because he didn't live that long. His son shot and killed him in self-defense in 1924, got away with it, scot free. So, you know, the guy friggin' sucked, but... He didn't live very long to suck for very long. Bartolo Fontana would later confess during the Good Killers trial that this was all part of the Good Killers case, which means that there's some serious headers that took place in these murders. Giuseppe Morello had gone to Nicolo Shiro, who had the Good Killers in his back pocket because the Good Killers were members of Shiro's family. We'll talk more about the Good Killers in a few minutes. But anyway, they had fought side by side in the first Mafia War, and Morello reached out to Shiro to ask him for help in handling Loyekino's supporters. As a result of this war, Morello, Ignazio Lupo, and Umberto Valente ended up fleeing the country, running from a death sentence that Di Aquila had handed down to each of them. Nicolo Gentile said that the men had met up with him when he was in Italy vacationing there, and they had requested that he get a general assembly together to revisit the matter of their execution. He said that he couldn't handle it right then and there, and he advised them to not keep their appointments and to pretty much disappear. And we know that this is serious, because don't forget, Morello and Lupo, they both have convictions for murder in Sicily. So if they're willing to leave America and go to Sicily, where they have convictions waiting for them, rather than stay in America, they really have to be in fear for their lives. They all do eventually return back. Valente returned on January 18th, 1922. Morello arrived sometime around the same time, but like he came in using a fake name, so we don't know exactly the day he came back in. Lupo arrived on May 22nd, 1922, so only a few months later, but he was held in detention at Ellis Island until he was released on June 12th. So he was held in detention for a while at Ellis Island, and that's not like a prison. You don't get a conviction and wait there. It's kind of like the way that there's like immigration camps that are all kind of touchy right now. That's what was going on there. This man was locked up for like three months and just nobody knew he existed. Gentile ended up leaving Shiro's family and transferring to California not too long after, and he was doing that in order to help a different friend who was under order of execution. But he was also trying to help these guys. So as Gentile left New York, he met up with Valente, who met up with him in Boston. He was ordered to accompany Valente to have him killed, but he didn't do that. He just helped him get out and get to Sicily and Valente gave Gentile a forwarding address. So he trusted Gentile. During this war, Morello called up all his boys. Like, he even picked up Al Capone and named him as a capo de Chena and gave him his own crew to help him fight this war, which caused a huge problem with Chicago because Capone had already headed there and belonged to Chicago, so the fact that he's coming back to New York to fight a war there is a pretty big deal. Gentile did not just give up, though. He fought hard to get a new hearing and a new verdict for his friend Valente. He fought against it so hard that he even ended up going to Cleveland to meet up with another friend of Shiro's and another mafioso that I just so happened to have covered, Big Joe Leonardo. Leonardo turned him down, saying that everybody had already had a meeting, and they all agreed that these guys should die, so like, why are you bothering me? When he didn't get anywhere and he didn't get the answer that he wanted, Gentile decided that Leonardo was stupid, or slow-witted as he described him, and he was too stupid to argue with, so he pursued other adventures. Next, he headed to Cali to see his good killer's ally Frank Lanza to discuss the murder order for not one, but two of his boys. So now he has two people who have execution orders against them and they're fighting. One is Valente and one is the execution order that he had picked up the fight for in California. So he's fighting for these guys to not be killed. While he's in California, 
he picks up an additional person that has a murder order that he wants to save. Now he's going around the country lobbying for not one, not two, but three people to have murder orders rescinded. He was able to get one, the one that he picked up in Cali, rescinded with the boss of Los Angeles, Rosario Di Simone. The boys that ran for Sicily, they're also trying to fight for their cause while they're in Italy, trying to get important Sicilian mafioso on their side, and they even end up meeting up with Salvatore Maranzano when he's there for a visit. Diaquella did eventually make peace with Umberto Valente, saying he would forgive him if, and only if, he did him a favor and eliminated a strong adversary. None other than Joe the Boss Masseria, who was currently a capo and on the rise. Masseria, this man was attacked so many times and escaped so many assassination attempts that it feels like he was almost on a daily basis. But on August 8th, Valente attacked Masseria at his home. If you watch a lot of my videos, you will recognize this situation. Let me know if you remember where I've talked about a similar situation. But this attack is wild because when Valente attacked Masseria, a bunch of people were striking nearby. They see this altercation and they surround the guy's car that are fleeing because Masseria had gotten away. And they're trying to flee the scene, but these guys that are striking, they come and they surround the car so they can't leave. Now, Valente, who had attacked Masseria and three other people in the car, opened fire into this group. Eight people were shot when 25 shots were lobbed into this crowd, and miraculously, nobody died. Most tragically, though, a pony was shot. Do you know what I just realized, though? This is the scene. This is the scene. This is the scene from the movie where the cops walk into the apartment and find him sitting on his bed with bullet holes in his hat. I can't remember for sure, but I want to say it's one of the Godfather movies. Umberto Valente was shot and killed on August 11th, 1922. Gentile had recently left the city and he begged Valente to come with him, knowing that he had tried to kill Masseria and Masseria is now going to be on a warpath for revenge. But Valente, he's like, no, I don't want to leave. And boom, he's dead. I want to say that Valente's death was also in the same movie as the Straw Hat attack. He was shot and he tried to shoot back, but he couldn't lift his gun. It's driving me crazy that I can't remember for sure what movie it was, but I'm almost positive it was The Godfather. Like, I'm 99.9% .9 sure it was The Godfather. And I want to say that it was The Godfather's father that was shot on the street but couldn't lift his gun. It sounds really familiar. This war came to a conclusion during a peace conference that was held on August 25th, 1923, but some remnants of this war would last into 1924. And this war saw the initial separation of the Corleonesi family into two separate factions. Gaetano Reina would take control of one side and Masseria would take control of the other. Now, this family was originally under Morello, and since he had now fled the country, Gaetano Reina was leading the one family, and Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria is leading the other. And now, the framework for the modern-day New York City families is laid out. We officially have five families. Now, while the New York City families have been cemented, and we have the groundwork for what we know now, there's other families being laid out too. Most notably right now is the Detroit family. Gaspar Malazzo, one of the dudes that had fled after the Good Killers case, which we still haven't gone over. We have to go over the Good Killers case. But Gaspar Malazzo had headed for Detroit and became the boss of the family over there. He is pretty much the Kapu D2T copy of Detroit, but other Detroit fractions already exist there, including the Toko, Zarilli, and Mele family. Cesar Chester Lemaire was another notable boss, and he is over in Detroit, and he is just stirring up all kinds of shit. He has a plan to take out six bosses in Detroit, and he requests a meeting between all the bosses in Detroit. The leaders of all the other families are like, <laughs> yeah, okay, do you think we're fucking stupid? Do you, is that what you think? You think we're stupid? Nah, we're good, fam. You have a blast, and we're just gonna go ahead and sit this one out. Mm, absolutely not. Malazzo, being known for his mediation abilities and probably the most highly regarded mafioso in Detroit, is like, all right, listen, listen, ju just listen, guys. This guy is obviously trying to come to some sort of peace agreement. We can't just ignore his pleas for a meeting. 
This fighting is tiresome. He wants to come to peace. Let's hear him out. All the other leaders are like, huh, no, we're good. You go ahead and do that. We're going to set our asses at home. Thank you very much. All the other dudes come together and they all agree that Malazzo would be the safest one to go there and meet him. There's no way that Lemire would make a move on Malazzo, not with the amount of clout that Malazzo has. Malazzo goes to meet him and lo and behold, Lemaire is waiting there and he takes out Malazzo and his right-hand man as they're eating lunch. See, what nobody knew at the time was that Lemaire had recently had a little sit-down with Masseria and gotten his support. Malazzo and Magadino had recently been having little powwows and they had been plotting to take out Masseria. So Masseria turns around to Lemaire and he's like, all right, listen, I can't go into your house and kill a boss, but if you take him out, I'll totally back you in taking over all of Detroit. And Masseria was kind of known for doing dirty little tricks like this. Like, he did this all over the country. This is nothing new for Masseria. So let's talk about these guys for a minute, because if you watch my other videos or have prior knowledge of the Mafia, you're going to know a lot of these names. But this is the first time I'm saying these names in this video. So let's go through this real quick. Salvatore Maranzano is a mafioso who was the boss of the mafia over in Castello Mare del Golfo in Sicily. He is sent by the Capo dei Tutti Capi in Sicily, Don Vito Ferro, over to America to try to take over from Joe the Boss Masseria. The plan originally was for Ferro to take control through Maranzano and run the American mafia in Sicily. But when Don Vito Ferro was arrested while Maranzano was in the middle of enacting his plan, Instead of just giving up and going back to Sicily, Maranzano continued on with the plan, and he decided that he would just run it in America. Maranzano joined and eventually took control of the Casella Mare group that included mafiosi like Joseph Bonanno, Stefano Magadino, Joseph Perfacci, and Joe Aiello, and was currently being led by Niccolo Shiro. When he first came on, Niccolo Shiro is the boss of the family, and Maranzano was more than happy to just be the top lieutenant under him. Masseria, he is a member of the group that had stayed loyal to Morello. So remember, when the Morello split, there was two groups. There was one group that was loyal to Morello, there was one group that wasn't. Masseria had started leading the family that was loyal to Morello, so he's the boss of that family. While the other side has pretty decent guys, Maranzano has pretty decent guys, but Masseria definitely wasn't lacking. His crew consisted of Lucky Luciano, Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Alfred Minio, Willie Moretti, Joe Adonis, and Frank Costello. Now, regardless of how safe Lemaire felt playing this game with the backing of Masseria, the heads of the rest of the Detroit families came at this man with a vengeance. And Lemaire, along with 14 of his associates, his entire faction were dead within one year of killing Gaspar Malazzo. Lemaire had run away to Brooklyn in the summer of 1930, but he returned in February of 1931. He was dead within two weeks of arriving back in Detroit. These men were not playing. They had a grudge. And this actually makes me happy that he died because Malazzo was a really cool dude. If you go watch the episode that I made about Malazzo, I really think you'll agree. He was like the peacemaker. He did everything he could to keep his people out of crime and keep violence on the right side of things. Like he, he didn't want his people doing violence. He didn't want crime being committed. So the fact that he was killed is bullshit. Malazzo and Magadino had been working together to come up with a plan to take out Masseria because at this time, tensions had already began to brew between Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano, a member of Shiro's family, was biffles with both Malazzo and Magadino. They're all members of the Casella Mare del Golfo faction, which Shiro was currently heading. That means that when Masseria made the move and took out Malazzo, it was a direct hit to Maranzano and, by essence, the boss of his family, Niccolo Shiro. So now, beef is on between Masseria and Shiro, and not only that, but the entire Castella Marisi faction is pissed as hell at Masseria. A lot of people argue that the death of Malazzo is actually what kicked off the Castella Marisi War. Others argue that it was the murder of Gaetano Reina that started the war, but either way, these two are two huge hits against the faction of Niccolo Shiro, and either way, 
the war that got kicked off was kicked off and it changed everything for the mafia. All right, guys, I swear, I swear I tried. I tried really hard to make this into one episode, but it is just not happening. I'm going to have to make this two parts for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and you'll come back next week for part two of Nicolo Shiro. Thanks so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, comment, follow, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye!